Hey, Sam, can you yes. hear me? Okay, yes. no, one, no one could hear anything, so I just rebooted it. Um, okay, cool. So people should yeah, be coming I back. I saw the chat going, exploding. <laughs> okay, let's get that presentation up. Sorry, everyone, I just rebooted the program. I'm sorry that you couldn't hear when Sam started. Um, let's just go ahead and get started once again. All right, Sam, whenever you're ready. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Sotomayor. I am the volunteer coordinator at the Civic Garden Center. I'm just going to briefly introduce the Civic Garden Center before An Angela jumps in on the worm bins. Um, we are a nonprofit whose mission is building community through uh, education, environmental stewardship, and gardening. We're located at the corner of Reading and Taft with two acres of botanical gardens. We invite you all to come down and check out the ground sometime soon. For those of you who have bought a worm bin, you will be picking up your worm bin from that location. So we'll see you soon anyway. Um, and we will have a series of, we have a series of classes, uh, ongoing classes throughout the year, um, as well as a number of programs, including community gardening and forest restoration work. So we'd love for you all to get more involved and we look out for our terrariums class coming up here soon. Um, last thing I'll mention is that we will be going over in more detail the worm bin uh, purchasing options and pickup location um, and all those details later on. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and just turn it over to Angela, and she's going to jump in on the worm bins. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I work for Hamilton County Recycling and Solid Waste District, and my job is to do public outreach and education around waste reduction. So the district is mandated a state mandated organization and we're funded through tipping fees into the landfill so every ton of garbage that you all generate we get a dollar for and that's how our um, government organization specifically is funded so we're separate from the general fund so i want to go over some logistics so if you're having some issues with sound or something um, hopefully this would be helpful for you so uh, firefox or Google Chrome will be the best browser options. Also, if you close any of the extra tabs or applications you have open, just because anything else that you have open on your phone or computer is going to use up bandwidth, which can affect the quality of this presentation. So Sam, if you can let people know that in the chat in case they aren't hearing me, that would be great. Um, so you are all getting already familiar with the chat. Go ahead and say hello. Um, welcome. Hopefully, we can use that area as a way to chat with each other, share suggestions, comments, and things like that. There's also an option kind of near where you type where you can switch from chat mode to Q&A mode. So if you see the words chat mode, there's a little icon right next to it, and you can switch to Q&A mode. And when you do that, it's actually going to put a little red circle next to your comment or your question that you're writing. And that will help us know where questions are. Hi, Angie. Hi, Aud. Audrey, Allison, nice to see you all. I'm glad you're here. Um, so many people are saying hello. So great, you're all starting to use that function. Again, if you can you try to use the Q&A mode um, next to the words chat mode, you just click the little icon and we'll switch and say Q&A mode. Um, if you don't do that, we'll find your questions, but it's, it makes it a little bit easier for all of us. You can also notice that there's a speak option. We're not going to invite anyone in to speak during this presentation. So please, again, use the chat area to do any of the questions that you have. We'll stop in the middle and then again at the very end for Q&A um, as we go. So right now I'm going to throw a poll out for all of you. You'll see it near the chat section. If you want to answer the question, which is what is your experience composting, it will help me understand who's in the virtual room with us tonight. Um, while you're answering that, you'll also notice there's a handout section or file section. I am giving you kind of a packet of information that will cover some of the things I'm talking about tonight. So if you want to refer back to it, you can download that at any point during this presentation. If you miss it, you can always email myself um, or Sam and we can get you that file through your email. We're also going to be playing some videos. If the sound seems pretty quiet, just turn it up. Sometimes the sound on the videos ends up being quieter than um, my voice. So go ahead and make sure you change that if it, you've noticed that it's a lot quieter during that time. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll so you can all see the results. And you'll notice that a lot of people have done some backyard composting. We have a good amount of people who have never composted before. Welcome to the composting community. I'm excited to have you here. Um, and only a few people who've done vermicomposting. So I'm really excited that a lot of you are here, going to be maybe learning a little bit about what this is and if you would want to embark on it in your home. 
So let's go ahead and get started. What are we learning about tonight? So vermicomposting is an indoor composting system that you're going to use a special kind of worm to consume your food waste and turn it into a specialized type of compost, which we call vermicompost. The word verma means worm. So if you're afraid of worms, vermicomposting might not be for you, but if you love worms or your family, or if you have kids that would love worms, this is a great family adventure to have. Um, I love bringing my worms and my, comp my, my mini composter out to the public and letting you all learn about this type of system. So we are going to go through this agenda in a moment. Um, so we're going to talk about why it's important to compost. We're going to talk about what's going to be living in that worm bin. We're going to talk about how to get started. I'm going to go through building your bin. So if you're not purchasing a bin through the Civic Garden Center, that you can build your own on your own time. Um, we will be building the bins for the people who order through our program. We also are going to talk about what the food is. We're going to choose where you're going to keep your warm bin. We're going to talk about the management of your bin, harvesting the compost out of your bin, and then we'll talk about upcoming opportunities and Q&A. So that's kind of the plan for tonight. We're going to have so much to talk about, so if I don't hit something that you ask about or are thinking, please reach out after this webinar and I'll be sure to find that information for you or get back to you as soon as possible. Um, this is going to be a basic overview of vermicomposting. So if you have a lot of technical questions, if you can please email me those directly, I will get back to you as soon as possible with the answers. We'll share our emails at the end. So I want to start by sharing our waste characterization study. This is basically what residents were throwing away in 2018 when we did the study. So this is residential waste going to the landfill. None of the things that you see in this circle were actually recycled or composted. So there is a lot of stuff that heads to our landfill that actually could be diverted through current compost infrastructure or recycling. So you'll notice that some of these things are organic, which are things that could be composted. And when we look at the results of that study, about 32% of the material sent to landfill could have been composted with current infrastructure. So you might be thinking, well, we don't have like a curbside compost pickup. You're right. This does not include that. Um, this only really includes something that you could compost through a backyard composting system, a vermicomposting system, or through... Um, our yard trimmings drop off sites that that material gets composted. So it does not include curbside pickup, which you could actually compost a lot more through that type of system. And that is just not feasible for most residents in our area, although it does exist in some areas of Hamilton County. Um, so it's a big part of our waste stream. We could divert a lot of this, and that's why we're involved in this topic, is that this would really help reduce waste if you can compost at your own home. I also want to kind of highlight something that a lot of people don't think about and is being brought to the forefront of environmentalism and that's preventing the waste of food. In your handouts there actually is a food storage guide that shows you how to best store produce but I want to let you know that composting including vermicomposting is actually one of the least preferred ways to prevent food from being wasted. About 40 percent of all food produced in the United States ends up in the landfill. That's a lot of food that could go to a lot of people but we have to know that that food is being produced to be consumed, not to be composted. Although composting is great for the environment, it is making something that's a soil amendment. It's not the reason why we grow and produce food. So that really is meant for scraps and left those types of things. Um, it's not the solution. So really starting to think about other habits your family can dive into in your household to work on that source reduction. How can we reduce how much food waste is and then use composting for your food scraps. We have whole webinars just on that topic, but that's my little 101. to get you thinking that composting is not the answer to getting rid of all your food waste. So warm bin composting. There is a special kind of worm friend that we're going to use, and we like to call this worm, the common name is a red wiggler. I'm terrible at Latin, so I'm not going to pretend to try to announce the scientific name, but it's up there. Um, so this is the specific kind of worm that you use for a vermicomposting system. These worms are voracious eaters. They eat about half their body weight in food a day, which is a lot. Um, so if you have about a pound of these, they can eat, and that would be about a thousand worms, a pound of worms in your vermicompost bin. They can eat about three and a half pounds of food waste a week. Um, this is pretty great. They are surface feeders, which is really important. So I'll talk a little bit about 
the difference between red wigglers and earthworms in a moment. This kind of worm likes to live on the surface, which means that they can live in a really shallow environment like a worm bin. Um, and they are, again, really ferocious eaters. So they are perfect for indoor composting. And where to buy them? You can buy them through this workshop. We are ordering our worms through Buckeye Organics. That is an Ohio-based company. And then there, you can also buy them online. Um, you can sometimes find these at bait shops and things like that. But the most important thing when you're buying from an organization is to check the scientific name because red wigglers could mean a thousand things to a bait shop owner. Um, but if you're not getting the right kind of worm, you're not going to get the results that you want. So again, check out the scientific name on the screen. I will not try to pronounce it because I'll embarrass myself. Um, but that is the type of worm that you need when you want to do indoor composting. It's going to give you the best results and the quickest results. So earthworms. Earthworms do not eat as much food as our red wigglers. You can see kind of the size difference here. And earthworms are tunnelers, which means that they love to live deep underneath the ground. So they do not want to live or they're not going to thrive in that shallow vermicomposting system that you're going to create. So again, earthworms, not the answer. Will they eat food? Yes. Will you get the best results? No. Um, so red wigglers are the best option for a vermicomposting system. Okay, the anatomy of the worm. Um, so this is the inside of the worm, and I'm just going to point out a few things that are going to be relevant to our conversation tonight, is that <clears throat> You can kill a worm if you cut it in half. So their hearts are all on the left side of the screen here. And they can regrow small parts of like their tail if it gets cut off. But if you cut them off right in the middle, they're not going to grow back. So be kind to your worms, especially if you have kids who are exploring the world around them. Um, do not squish them. They also have a gizzard. So that gizzard is going to help break down the food waste and help them digest it. So we're actually going to add some grit or some dirt and soil into your bin to start it off to provide that grit for the gizzard of the worms. Another thing I want to point out is the cotellum. So that's the band that you're seeing around the outside of this worm. That is going to tell you that a worm is sexually mature and they are ready to reproduce. So talking about reproduction, all worms um, are hermaphrodites, so they're not female or male. And students always ask me, like, oh, is it a girl or a boy? It's actually both. Um, so they actually, when they have that, tell them they'll rub against another worm and they'll exchange genetic information. And that's going to then help the worm create a cocoon. And I didn't know that worms had cocoons until I started vermicomposting, so this is really cool, I think. Um, and the cocoons are about the size of a match head. They change in color. They're going to start off kind of the whiter yellow color that you see on the screen. And then when they're ready to hatch a few weeks later, they turn a dark red. The There will be several little baby worms that come out. Ten would be a lot. It's usually two to five, somewhere around that range. And they're called wormlets, which I think is a really cute name for a baby worm. They also regulate their own population growth. So if the conditions in the bin are not optimized, they will not reproduce. So if there is not enough food for them, they will not continue to grow their population. So worms are amazing creatures. And ecologically speaking, it makes so much sense that if there was not enough food, we wouldn't repopulate, right? So the worms do that for you. You're not going to end up with so many worms that you can't handle it. Um, the worms know what they need to survive in space and food and other conditions, which we'll talk through tonight. So that's a little bit about the worms, but there are lots of other things that may live in your bin. Um, so especially if you add any like flowers or yard waste or leaves, you're going to get lots of different things. And those things are all going to be helpful. Most are going to be helpful for breaking down that food waste. Um, so you might find pill bugs, you might find sow bugs, you might find little worms or mites, and there'll be bacteria and fungus, and it's going to create an entire microecosystem for the worms and your bin, and it's going to be amazing. Um, however, if you find things like centipedes or ants, those are actually predators, and I try to remove them from my bin if I find them, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have like insects all over my home? No, um, I've never had them escape. You are providing them food. They're not going to leave. Um, so I've never seen anything try to escape my bin. And I definitely have more than just the worms living in there. 
Um, the only time I've heard of that really happening is if you drown your worms and there's too much liquid. So we'll talk about how to remedy that in a short while. So food web of the compost pile, it's amazing. So getting started. So um, on the left here is a DIY or do-it-yourself bin. This is the kind of bin that you'd be getting if you order through the program. I'm also going to show you how to build this kind of bin. And then on the right is a warm hotel. So there's lots of different brands of this type of system. And I'll show you a video of how this is used in a little while. But just know there's lots of different systems that you can purchase or you can build yourself. So unfortunately, when you're wanting to buy a vermicomposter like this warm, this is specifically called the warm factory, it can be upwards of $100, which is a lot of money. Um, so DIY, especially if you're just trying this out and seeing if you're liking it and spending less than $20 on supplies to build it is probably more feasible before you go all in and purchase a bigger system. But if you are loving it, you definitely can do that. So choosing a bin. So if you choose to build yourself a bin um, or you're looking around on the internet for one to purchase, you're going to want it shallow for a vermicomposting system. And that means no more than 12 to 18 inches in height. You're going to want there to be some type of aeration, so there's holes in it, um, provides airflow in and out of the bin. Worms respire carbon dioxide, so if you don't have any way for that carbon dioxide to leave the bin, your poor wormies are going to die. So make sure there's some type of aeration. And I'm going to go over all of the, these pieces in the video of how to build the bin in a, a few minutes. You're also going to want drainage, so you don't want your worms to drown. So you may poke holes in the bottom of your bin. You may put some netting. You may have a pore spout. So those are all common things. Um, wood or plastic is really the best options. If you use metal, that might not be so great because it can really hurt the warm skin since it is very smooth and sensitive. Um, so wood or plastic is a better option. Just thinking that wood will decompose over time, you might need to replace it. Plastic may be more durable for a longer period. Also, when you're choosing the size of your bin, you're going to need about one square foot for every pound of food waste that you're going to be putting in your bin a week. So I would recommend if you don't know where your family's at, kind of collect your food scraps over a week and see how much that is. Um, and then you'll know how big the bin can get. Okay. So that would be ideal conditions. Starting the bin, you're going to add a bedding for the worms. You're going to add the food sources, soil and dirt, and then you're going to add bedding back on top. Bedding options, um, you're going to either use leaves or shred newspaper are the most common options that people choose to do and can usually find pretty easily. So again, this is going to all be seen being put together in just a moment. And after that, I'll answer questions about um, building your bin. So let's go ahead and watch that video. I'm going to first show you the video of how to build your own vermicomposting system. This is also going to be the way we're going to build the ones if you purchase it through the Civic Garden Center. Then I'm just going to show you a short clip on how to use a warm hotel and kind of what the benefits of that are. So put throw your questions in the chat. I might answer some of them as we're watching the video, but otherwise I'll come back here afterwards and we'll go through any questions that people might have so far in this presentation. And I know I'm speaking really fast, so I'll start to slow down. So hopefully you can notice that. Um, I get really excited if you can't tell. So I'm going to go ahead and start that video for you right now. And this is going to show you how to build your own vermicompost system. Hi everyone, today I'm going to show you how to make your own vermicomposting bin. So I'm going to go ahead and explain some of the things you need to get started. First of all, you're going to need some type of container. We'd recommend wood or plastic and it's going to want to be about 12 to 18 inches in height. You're going to want about one square foot per, per pound of food waste that you're going to be composting per a week. So I'm going to go ahead and start with this. this is a 10 gallon bin. So that's my first thing. This is actually going to be the vermicompost system here. Then you're going to want to have some few shovelfuls of dirt. So I just went over to the side of my house, dug this up. Then you're going to want the worms. You can't see my worms right now um, because I'm actually harvesting these from the current bins I have. But you can order these online and you'll have a big thing of worms. And you're going to want about a pound of worms. It's going to be between 500 and 1,000 worms. So I have a few hundred in here that are going to help me get started today. Then you're going to want to drill. And you're going to want a drill bit that's about 3 sixteenths. Okay, so that's what I'm going to use. 
to drill in my vermicomposting system. And then you're also gonna want some bedding and then you're gonna want some food sources. These are all things that you're gonna need to actually start vermicomposting and you're gonna want most of that before you even have the worms, just so you can prepare your bin and make home for them. So right when you get your worms, they can get happy and healthy and start eating for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and start drilling. So what I'm gonna be doing in a moment is I'm gonna be drilling holes all along the top of this bin, and that's gonna be for air circulation. So because we're using worms, they're living creatures and they aerobically respirate. So we want air flow to go in and out of the bin. So we're gonna put those in for ventilation. I'm gonna put them all throughout the sides, and then I'm also gonna be drilling holes in the bottom, and this is for drainage. So you could also use some type of spout to put in the side of the bin, and whenever there's excess moisture, you want that to be able to drain out of the bin. If you don't do that, you could end up drowning your bins in the excess water. So under here, I'm actually gonna be placing another lid. This is from an old container, and you're gonna see some wood planks. You could use a variety of things, but anytime there's excess water and there's drainage out through the bottom of those holes, it's gonna land in here. If I didn't put it up an inch or so, the worms could start drowning, right? Because it's gonna be flush where the liquid is draining out. So I'm gonna go ahead and start drilling those holes. Uh, again, we want the air ventilation on the top and then we want the holes on the bottom for drainage. vermicomposter ready is add some bedding. So today I'm going to use newspaper but you can also use leaves. So I'm going to show you over here that I have already soaked some newspaper in some water. I'm going to go ahead and squeeze out any excess water. So you again you don't want it to be too wet in your bin but the worms breathe through the skin so they're going to want a nice smooth surface. So you're going to squeeze out that water and then you're going to fluff it. So you can see here I've already fluffed my newspaper for my composter. So I'm gonna go ahead and put about a pound to two pounds of newspaper in the bottom of my bin. And this is, again, gonna be the bedding for the worms. So that's my start of my bin. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add that dirt. So I'm gonna sprinkle it. This is gonna add some grit. The worms have a gizzard. So this actually is gonna help them digest the food. So I'm gonna sprinkle that all in with some soil from my garden. And then before I add the worms, I'm gonna add some of my food. So I have my compost collector, and I'm going to be adding some food. You can see I have some paper in there that I'll have to shut up. And for the start of my worm bin, I'm gonna go ahead and just spread out all of my food for my worms. All right, from here, before I add my worms, I'm gonna go ahead and give that top layer of bedding. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab some more, and I'm gonna go ahead and fluff it again on the top. And I'm gonna have a total of three to four pounds of newspaper at the very end. And I have a few pounds of food scraps. So now that I have this, I'm actually gonna uncover so I can see my food scraps and I'm gonna be pouring my bins in this area. So on our website, you can find a few different locations of where to order worms if you wanna to choose to do this, but it's important that there are red wigglers. So this is a worm that is a ferocious eater and will do the composting in your home for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover these up. They are afraid of light. And there's my vermicomposter. So the last thing I'm going to do is make sure I put my lid on and have that drainage basin on the bottom. So I'm gonna actually let this warm bin sit for a week um, just to get them acclimated to their new home. And then when I wanna start adding my food scraps after that, usually what you do is you may put your food scraps from Monday here, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're actually gonna work your way around the bin as you go. And then if you wanna learn how to harvest your compost at the end, check out our, one of our Verma compost webinars or seminars, and it's gonna teach you everything you need to know. But this is how to start setting up your bin. You can see here, this is actually finished Verma compost. 
I'm going to use this for a variety of things, um, and you can learn more about that from our webinar and seminars. But that's what the finished product is going to look like. So you're definitely going to reap the benefits of the Verma composting system. And again, this is a DIY. You're going to leave the lid on most of the time and make sure you have some drainage basin underneath. All right, so that's how you build a bin. Um, I answered some of the questions. A lot of the questions that you're coming up with are great, and I'm going to answer some of them after the Q&A. Um, I'm going to answer questions about anything that we did up until this point, and then food sources and things like that I'll answer after the Q&A and answer more questions about later on. But before we do that, um, so Sam, if you want to start picking out some questions, uh, I'm going to show you how I will use a, you could use a warm hotel, just so you have an idea of what that kind of system is like. Here we go. All right, so this is a warm hotel. There are lots of different variety of these. You can actually DIY your own. Um, but I want to just kind of explain for you what this does. So here there is a spout system that allow any extra water to come out. And what you have here, and you can see this is my top, and this bin I actually using bedding of leaves. And Underneath is where I had my most recent food scraps. So this is where the worms are going to be and they're eating and then I just harvest this so That's why the top is only bedding right now and when the worms run out of food on this layer I'm going to start adding food to this layer and the worms are actually going to migrate out through these holes on the bottom of the vermicompost system so they can fit through those and they just migrate up. So what happens is, is that eventually, if you keep adding food to the top layers, the very bottom layer is gonna have very minimal worms. So you can see they're still digesting some of the stuff left here. There are some worms, but at the very end, there should be no worms here because they're gonna be migrating upwards towards the layers that have food. So that's what the concept of a worm hotel is. Um, and it might be another option for you to either build one or purchase one on your own. All right, so as you can see in this picture, it's kind of like a mix between the two things you just saw, the one I built and then the warm hotel. So you can DIY your own. Um, you would just want to have stilts kind of in between each one if the layers would hit each other too much. Um, and just a clarification, we're not going to be providing a drainage basin like the lid I had for you. If you purchase a warm bin, you're just going to get the warm bin. So just think about the fact that you will want to put that on top of something when you bring it home. Um, so Sam, if you can turn your microphone back on and do you want to share with me any questions that our listeners had? Yep. So uh, one question is what uh, if the leaves need to be brown and dry or if the leaves are, it's okay if they're green and wet? So for the bedding, um, it would be better for dry leaves. Um, if you're familiar with backyard composting, you would know greens and browns. So browns are your carbon source and then, um, sorry, browns are your carbon source and greens are your nitrogen source. Um, and so if the leaves are still green, they're gonna act as a nitrogen. If they've dried out, they're gonna act as a carbon. And the bedding really should be carbon-based. So you can definitely add le green leaves into there. I have some flower leaves and things that I've put in there when they die off from a okay um, but for your bedding options you do want those dried leaves and then how often should that bedding be refreshed or added new material to so ideally you want to, anytime you look in your bin you're gonna always want to see bedding on the top so if you're noticing that it's almost all gone you may want to add some more to the top unless you're about to harvest then you don't have to worry as much about it but really that bedding is gonna help reduce how many in like flying insects and fruit flies that you might get and it's going to help with the reproduction process of the worm so every time you open your bin you should see the bedding um, on top so if you don't see it add some more uh, another good question um, are do these red wigglers compete with indigenous worms yeah, so all worms in the United States are non-native um, that does not mean they're invasive but um, they should not survive in our Ohio climate, um, so technically no, but the thing is that animals evolve and things can change. So we actually recommend never um, putting the worm bin outside or having the red wigglers outside. This is not the kind of worm that you'd buy to put in a backyard system. This is specific for an indoor system. So just because we never know what will happen when animals evolve, we don't want them to become invasive. And there are invasive worms in the United States, but the earthworm is a non-native worm that we have. Um, so it, could they compete? 
yes, because things change quickly. <laughs> All right, last question for right now. Does the ink in the newspaper cause any harm to the worms? So most ink in the United States or all ink in the United States really is soy-based, so it should not cause a problem for your worms. I like to mix it up just because I like more variety for my worms to have leaves and newspaper. Um, but no, it will not hurt the worms. Great. Okay, so feel free to keep throwing questions in there. I'm going to be answering some of the questions that people had in a moment. Um, thank you, Sam. So food sources. So uh, vermicomposting, the worms are a little bit pickier than a backyard composting system. So some of these things you'd be like, I can put that in my compost bin backyard, but might not be good to put it in your vermicomposting bin. So there are some more limitations with this than there is an outdoor system or commercial composting. So the do's, these, this is the list. And again, um, if you want to have this list, it's going to be, this exact slide is going to be in that handout so you can download. Also in the chat box at the very top, I put a, like a little sticky note and it says, Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applehoff. This book, it's right here, this is the old version, is very, very good. It, it tells you everything you need to know about vermicomposting and I would highly recommend this. If you are a teacher, there's actually a teacher book to go with this that you can have activities for your students. So. If you want more resources to learn more about what they can eat or anything that I'm talking about, this book is great. That title is in the top of the chat. So they can eat pretty easily. Vegetables, fruits, eggshells. Somebody, I think, mentioned that um, about can you use eggshells as grit? Yes. Um, that would be a good source if you don't want to add soil or dirt in there. Um, eggshells, again, but not eggs themselves, so just the shells. Plain grains, so like old pasta, bread, and rice, things that maybe have gone bad that you no longer can eat, but hopefully you eat your food, um, and those things don't go in there. But if you do happen to have those, put them in your warm bin. Um, beans, dead plants, coffee grounds, and citrus. You'll see there's a little asterisk there. Um, it's in moderation. Since those things are more acidic, they can kill your worms. Um, so we don't want too much acid, so don't make a whole bunch of margaritas and add all the limes at one time. Um, I try to only add like one citrus thing every couple of weeks. So citrus things, yes for a backyard composting system, not for an indoor composting system. And then the do nots. The biggest things that you should not put in your bin are meat, dairy, anything that's oily. They cannot break down safely in this kind of system and we don't want um, any bad harmful bacteria to get into your vermicompost when it's finished and that you would use. And again, highly acidic food, you don't wanna use that too much. You just don't wanna kill your worms. So just again, use coffee grounds and citrus in moderation. Coffee grounds are less acidic than if you have fresh, like used coffee grounds are less acidic than fresh coffee grounds. So um, just kind of keep that in mind when you're choosing what to put in your bin. So how do you feed them? Um, so you heard this a little bit in the video, but basically you're going to kind of work your way around your bin with your family. You're going to maybe start in the top left and you're going to bury your food scraps underneath the bedding, maybe underneath the vermicompost if there's some there. And then on Tuesday, you're going to put it in the middle and on the, the next day, you're going to put it on the top right. And then you're going to work your way around the bin. If you get back to Monday and the food is not gone. It should not be there. You should not see it. It should all be vermicompost. That means you might need a bigger bin or that you're just going to not be able to compost for a few days. You need to let the system settle and kind of get working. Um, so it can be slow at times. And I'll talk a little bit more about the temperature that has optimal conditions for the worms in a minute. But just do know if you get your way back to Monday and it's not decomposed yet, I would not continue to add food until that's broken down. You could check Tuesday and see if that area is. It really depends what you eat. Like an avocado pit or a peach pit, those things take forever to break down. I think I have an avocado pit in there from like a year and a half ago. It's still there. It finally broke in half, which I was impressed. Um, but some of those things are really fibrous. They will take forever to break down. You may choose to remove them at some point. Um, but just so you know, those big seeds and especially thick seeds may stay in your bin for a long time, but you can still add to it um, just because the worms are going to prefer the thing that's easy to eat, right? Um, 
Okay, so location, where should you put your bin? What kind of conditions do you want? The best temperature for optimal consumption for the worms and reproduction is between 50 and 77 degrees. So a garage would be a really great place to keep your warm bin underneath the sink. Um, they do have a threshold of 32 degrees to 86. So under 32 degrees, they will freeze to death above 86 degrees, you'll probably boil them. Um, so you want to kind of be careful. You're not going to want to put this out in the sun, right? Again, you, like I just said, you don't want to boil them. You don't want to heat up too much inside of that vermicompost. And these are relying solely on really the worms in this type of system. Um, so backyard composting system is fine to be in the sun. It has a lot more aeration, a lot more other organisms eating the compost than in a verma or a warm bin system. Um, you're going to want aeration. So again, you want airflow. You don't want to be really stagnant wherever you put your warm bin because they do respire and you want them to survive. Um, and then you're going to insulate. Like if you put it in your garage and your garage is not heated, mine's not, you could wrap around a blanket if you choose to keep it in your garage. So just think about these are some things to consider when you're deciding where you want to store your warm bin. Um, I've also stored my warm bin in my family room. I don't care too much. My child loves to try to dig in it. Um, you could also put it in your laundry room. Just really depends on your family and what if your family members are okay with you having a warm bin in your kitchen or not. Um, otherwise, the garage should be fine. I wouldn't store outdoors, um, but you you could. Um, but you again, think of the temperature threshold. You're probably going to have to move it inside in the um, summer or in that winter. Sorry. Management. So moisture. Um, moisture should be like a wrung out sponge. I am notorious for adding too much and having mine be too little too wet. Um, I'll talk about how to remedy that in a moment. Um, and I just, I don't optimize my management skills in my warm bin, um, even though I know how to. So moisture, like a wrung out sponge. You don't want it dripping and you don't want it like really dry, right? These worms need a moist environment to live and grow. Drainage, again, that's important. Having something to catch that excess liquid. Somebody mentioned compost tea. I'll show you, tell you how to make compost tea in a couple minutes using your finished vermicompost, but any like liquid that drains out the bottom of your bin, you could use as liquid fertilizer. Um, you could also use a drainage sport spout if you choose to put that on. And the biggest thing that you're gonna see is a remedy for a lot of problems is bury your food scraps. Your food should never be thrown on top. That's going to encourage fruit flies and it can get smelly. Um, so bury your food scraps is a best practice. And in the picture, you'll actually see um, the optimal vermicompost. And on the right side, that stuff looks great. You don't see any food sticking out. It's really broken down. It's still pretty moist. Um, on the left, it's really light gray, has paper still in it. Not great for actually using. Um, and we have found that if you add leaves, it actually makes the vermicompost a little bit darker, which is interesting observation um, that my boss had. So she always likes to add some leaves just because it looks darker and richer than if you just use newspaper for your bedding. So some of the common problems, fruit flies. Someone already asked about this. How do you keep those insects away? So fruit flies um, lay their eggs on the skins of different fruits and vegetables. So when those fruits and vegetables are exposed to air, they hatch, um, which is not good. But because we know that, we can remedy this problem, burying your food scraps. If you make sure that none of your banana peels or whatever you're putting in there is laying out and it's really buried underneath any of the vermicompost under the bedding, you should avoid fruit flies. I've been vermicomposting for more than two years now, and I really haven't had a problem with it. Um, but I'm also very intentional about I don't want fruit flies. Um, you could also put a fly tape if you don't mind. Might as well just catch them, that's fine too. Uh, you can build a fruit fly trap. This could be uh, like apple cider vinegar. I have a quick recipe in that um, handout section that you could download. And it, I think it's vinegar, water, and like dish soap. Um, anytime you're gonna put a trap in your bin, you're gonna wanna put it kind of in the middle and above where the worms are because again, vinegar is, is gonna kill your worms. So um, you don't want that trap to tip over. So just something to consider. And it's noted in the handout. Water collecting in the bin. So if you dig through your bin and there's a lot of water in it, your worms are going to try to escape. This is the only time I really know of worms trying to escape a bin is because they're drowning. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you have those drainage holes. Um, you may need, I also um, use a trowel or a 
shovel and I dig up the corners of my bin. I have one of those DIY ones and it tends to build up water more in those corner areas. So I sometimes go in and just aerate it and trowel it and push the vermicompost away from the corners a little bit to help with it. But other things you can do to reduce how much moisture there is in your bin is you can take the lid off for a few days. Let it air out. Add fresh bedding and fluff. Sometimes I don't like submerge my bedding in water before I put it in there because then it's too moist. Um, I sometimes will just spray it with like a sprayer and then just get it a little damp before I put it in there. Um, and you should stop, consider stop adding food, right? You have a lot of, a lot of food is high in water content. Like if you put all of the rinds from a watermelon in your bin at the same time, you will have a lot of excess water and you will see drainage. So you may want to consider um, stop adding food if you're getting a lot of water just to let it balance back out. And then the third management tip I'm going to go through is the smelliness. I ha There's more management tips in the handout that you can check out. Um, but these are just three of the ones that I felt were most common questions that I get. So if it's getting smelly, what do you do? You bury your food scraps. Again, that's an important thing. And I wish if you're going to take anything away from this when you start composting in any situation, always bury your food scraps. You can add blood, bedding and fluff it when you're starting to get smelly, trying to suppress any smells. And again, stop adding food until bounce out. It's okay. I know that you want to um, help the environment and add food scraps in and not put anything to the landfill. But also make this a good experience for your family. Okay. So if you need to stop adding food, be realistic. It's okay. It will be all right. Um, start again when you can, when everything is balanced back out and is not smelly and is not watery. Okay. Um, it's okay. So harvesting your compost. I'm going to show you one last video on how to do this. Um, in the warm hotel, again, um, basically when the worms migrate up towards the food, the bottom tray of that warm hotel will likely have no worms in it. Whenever I harvest, I'm actually hand going through all the vermicompost, trying to pick out any cocoons or any worms. Because I, again, these are non-native and we recommend that you do not add them to your environment. So I'm going to show you how to harvest a DIY bin. This is kind of the most common way that people do it. And you'll see that I'm going to make little pyramids like in the picture. And I'll answer. We're almost done. We're getting there. Um, so we'll answer questions again at the end. Um, right after I show you this video, Sam is going to talk about pickup. Um, I'll share some more opportunities upcoming for the county and some resources to help you further your composting knowledge. And then we'll do that Q&A and have our contact information. So I'm going to go ahead and play that video for all of you. And I hope you enjoy it. So to get ready for this day, what I've done is started to put all my food on one side of the worm bin. And this is going to encourage all the worms to move to one side. So when I harvest, I'm not finding a ton of worms in the compost I want to use. So to get started, you're going to need your worm bin. Prop it a little bit, like I just told you. Some type of plastic cover or tarp to put down. A trowel if you choose to, some gloves, and then a container to put your vermicompost. Let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is make large pyramids with the vermicompost from the side of the bin that does not have food on it. All right, now I'm going to wait 15 to 20 minutes and what I'm going to be waiting for is worms to migrate to the center since they are photosensitive, they're not going to be on the outside. And this is going to allow me to take off all the vermicompost around the outside without any worms being left over. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my harvesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to peel off the top of the pyramid. I'm going to quickly push my hands through, make sure there's no worms. These worms are not native to the United States, so we always want to try to keep those in our warm bin. So 
So if I find one, like I did right here, I'm gonna go ahead and throw it back. I'm also looking for cocoons or any food that is not fully decomposed. So I'm gonna throw those back into my warm bin. I notice I have a sticker from one of my food. I'm gonna go ahead and take that in, out and throw that in the garbage. Some other pieces of plastic that might have been stuck to food. So I'm gonna go ahead and sift through all of this, looking for worms and cocoons and any de undecomposed food. Alright, so I'm all done and I have all this vermicompost. Look up for another video on how to use this, but remember, anything that still looks like food, put back in your warm bin to finish decomposing. And I hope you enjoyed this video. I realized I have one more slide and then Sam, you can jump in um, using your vermicompost. Um, so what can you use it for in the end? I've answered some of the questions that were in the chat section. So check out, I try to put your name first so you can drive your attention to it. Um, so preparing your compost, after you take it out, I would recommend letting it sit for a few months to let any of those worms or cocoons die off before you actually use it. So you're not adding those worms to wherever you're putting your rum compost. You could also bake or freeze it. Um, just realize that baking or freezing it will kill any of the bacteria that's living in the verma compost that you might want to add to your plants. If you decide to use the verma compost um, in your potted plants, so we recommend using this indoors you're going to want a one to four ratio. So no more than 25% of the material in your pot should be vermicompost. It is a really strong um, fertilizer. That's what you're creating, something to add nutrients to your plants and to the soil. Um, so no more than 25% vermicompost. For actually regular backyard composting, you can go up to about 50% and you'll be fine. But adding more than 25% um, of vermicompost or the warm bin compost, because it's so potent, could kill your plants. Um, to create compost tea, what you can do is um, do like what the picture shows up here. You can create like a colander or use a colander and that's what the black container is there. And you can put your vermicompost in there and then you can pour water through that colander and she's doing it multiple times. So that's gonna make a liquid fertilizer for you to use on your plants if you don't want to dig in the vermicompost into that soil. So if you're gonna add it to a potted plant, you could just trowel it on the top and that's fine or if you're planting a pot, you can mix it in with the soil. So that's how you use your vermicompost. So and now I've kind of gone over all the basic managements. Um, I'll be answering questions at the very end, but I want to turn this over to Sam. So if you are interested in purchasing a vermicomposting system with the Civic Garden Center, that you know what it's going to look like to pick it up and um, buy it. So Sam, if you want to turn your microphone back on, I'll... Sure. Yeah, so we are going to be building worm bins next Wednesday morning. Uh, so you'll have the option to purchase a worm bin from us if you would like that will already be fully put together. Um, it's $43 and as I mentioned, already gonna be put together, ready to go. Uh, and it will be available for pickup from the Civic Garden Center next week during Thursday and Friday. So June 18th and 19th. Uh, June 18th, it'll be available all day long. Um, 19th, it will just be in the afternoon, but you'll be picking it up from our green learning station. So in the picture on the slide there, you can see that building. It's at the corner of Reading Road and Oak Street, and you can see it pretty easily from the road. It's going to have a bunch of solar panels as well as kind of a green wall on the front. Uh, so that will is a pretty good way to catch the building. Um, and I'll be inside the building. So if you come around the parking lot there, uh, to the other side, you'll be able to see the bins will be set out kind of on the steps. Uh, bins will have been prepared, sanitized, and then put out there. Um, all you got to do is tell me what your name is. I'll check you off the list and you'll be on your way. So that's all for now for this end. We will also be sending out some details in terms of the address. Um, and some other, you know, just those pickup times, you can see them on the slide there, those pickup times for June 18th and 19th. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me, volunteer at civicgardencenter.org. I'll throw it in the chat, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and turn things back over to Angela. All right. So I want to share just a few resources that um, you might want to know about if you're into composting now or convince you to keep composting um, or try warm bin composting. 
so the confession of uh, the composter blog that's been going on for 10 years we post about all different types of composting including vermicomposting so if you want to learn more about composting and we do about every like two times a month we post um, join our blog i'm going to send links to all of these in the follow-up email that's coming in 10 minutes um, we also have a pinterest board about composting if you love pinning things and want to be able to refer to them later um, also on our website you can download a simple guide to composting in your backyard if you're interested in doing backyard composting and then also a really great resource to look at nationally what things are happening around composting is the US Composting Council. Again, I will email these out in nine minutes now um, with links so you can check them out. Upcoming events with us, we are doing our Get the ba Dirt on Backyard Composting next Monday and Tuesday. It again, it is a free webinar. On June 25th, we're doing a webinar with the Cincinnati Zoo and we're learning about waste reduction. They do a ton of stuff. They're one of the most sustainable zoos in the country. So what are they doing and how can you apply that to your home or workplace? We are going to talk about workplace waste reduction. So um, just check it out June 25th at 2 o'clock. That is a free webinar as well. I'll have a link to where to register for these in that email. We are also having our compost bin sale on June 27th. So if you want a backyard compost, you can join us for that. That's going to be, um, if you do the backyard composting seminars on Monday and Tuesday, you get a $10 off coupon for that compost bin sale. So it's a pretty good deal. The bins will be $35 for a backyard composting bin. Um, we're also right now having a recycled art contest going on. The theme is fun in the sun. So if you have a family, it is gonna be for K-12 children. Um, their families can be a team. And winners are going to get a gift card to Indigo Hippo, which is a creative reuse store um, for crafting. So definitely some fun things coming up. And all of this is on our website, HamiltonCountyRecycles.org. So here is our contact information. Uh, Sam, if you want to turn back on your microphone and then we can start answering any of the left over questions go ahead and write down our emails uh, we're gonna do about four minutes of questions and I we don't get to your question I'm so sorry um, but please email us and we'll get back to it as soon as possible sure one of the one question is um, any concerns about smell if you have this indoors yeah, I honestly have not had smelly again. Um, kind of the tips I gave, burying those food scraps is the biggest thing. Um, if it gets kind of moist, adding that bedding as well or stop adding food scraps for a short while. Is it okay to feed extra red wigglers to chickens? The, I would not feed your red wigglers to chickens. If you no longer want your red wigglers, I would um, give them to a friend or we do worm rescue. Um, so you probably could feed them to your chickens, but um, it wouldn't be a great use of your worms because they're kind of expensive. Um, we're for all of you just because I saw somebody asking like, "Hey, I can I can do my own." If you order worms, they're usually like thirty five dollars. So we're providing the worms and the bin for forty three. So and you're supporting a really great organization at the Civic Garden Center. So just some considerations if you're like, "Oh, I can build it at home," versus doing it um, with us. That's something that you might want to consider is that the worms can be expensive there's some concern about acidity in terms of what can be put in there and what can't uh, just maybe a few more examples around that yeah so uh, oranges limes lemons um, those coffee grounds grapefruit those are or like pineapple those are really acidic um, fruits that you probably don't want to put into your plant um, I have seen recommendation recommendations not to put too much like onions or garlic in there um, just because they the worms are very sensitive and they probably won't eat those things. They're going to try to avoid them. You'll get to know your worms. Um, you'll go in there and you'll see usually a banana peel full of hundreds of worms. Um, and then you'll see that little lime piece and there's no worms around it. Um, so you'll get to know what they like and if they're going to avoid something completely. But don't add too much citrus just because you don't want to hurt the worms. An example of an oily food not to use in the compost. Yeah, so if you have like lettuce that had um, dressing on it, that would be an oily food. Um, that's the one that's coming to mind. Anything that maybe was deep fried, like if you have um, like skin from a chicken that was deep fried or, you know, the breading of something that was deep fried, um, you definitely wouldn't want to put it in there. Um, I'm thinking mostly of like salad dressing off the top of my head. Um, there is also some um, question if you can have frozen food in the uh, worm bin 
yeah, you can add frozen food to your warm bin. Um, that's no problem. Just realize it's probably going to need to thaw out before they start eating it, but that will only take a couple hours to do. So if you do, somebody was saying that they have a lot of food scraps and they can't keep adding them. Um, if, so if you need to pause for a minute and you don't want to throw your food away, um, consider either getting a bigger bin um, so you have more surface area for the worms to feed. A warm hotel, I feel like I can usually put more material in because I can rotate it upwards and there's multiple trays. Um, or you can freeze it until you need food sources for your worms. Or if you're going on vacation and you need somebody to feed them, be like, hey, there's food scraps in the fridge or the freezer. Okay, so I'll answer one more question. I see a lot of them left. I'm so sorry, but we really want to, um, that email's getting sent at seven with the replay. So we got to cut it off so you all get the replay video, but you can, again, email me with any other questions we have. So do you see one more question? Um, yeah, so one last question. Uh, do we need to rinse off eggshells before throwing them in there or do they need to be crushed up at all? So I would crush them up. Any and Somebody just asked, this, uh, Teresa just asked about food grabs. Um, anytime you make things smaller, they're gonna decompose faster. So if you can break up those eggshells, cut up food, you don't have to do this, but they will break down faster, just like a backyard composting system. Um, so, that's kind of it. Um, I want to actually, because somebody asked this a while back um, about the office paper, you can use normal shredded paper. Um, it tends when it gets wet to really bunch up in balls and not being really good for fluffing. So you can use office paper, but it's not really the best paper to use. It's better to recycle office paper. A newspaper is a low quality paper, so it's might as well put it in there because it usually disintegrates during the recycling process anyways. Um, but office paper is really valuable and would be great for recycling. And if that's the only source of bedding you have, you can use it. But um, just be careful. You might need to fluff it every once in a while because it does get clumped up pretty tightly when it gets wet. So we're going to end it there. Thank you, Sam, for hosting this with us. And we will be sending out the replay along with the warm ordering information. And then Sam will email all of you who order worms tomorrow with the information about pickup. Um, and again, contact us if you have questions. So thank you so much for being on the webinar tonight, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye, everyone.